do get to turn the page today. We're turning into the beginning of Romans chapter 4, so I encourage you to grab your Bibles. Did you bring your Bibles this morning? I encourage you to bring them. And uh, thanks for lifting your phone. I appreciate that. <laughs> That's good. Uh, uh, in, the, in the book that Paul wrote, this letter to the church in Rome, he, uh, he pr- lays it out for us. In fact, you know, we've already been through those three miserable chapters as uh, Pastor Marcus describes them, so accurately describing the bad news of the good news found in chapters 1, 2, into chapter 3. And then we get to the good news of the good news where although no one is righteous, no one deserves anything from God, all there is is this, uh, you know, this um, righteous justice against ungodliness that's deserved in Romans 3.21, the good news of the good news begins when Paul writes, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And this gospel, so succinctly written for us, is what we celebrate. It's what we cling to. It's the beauty, it's the power of this message from God, that there is a righteousness made known to all who believe in Jesus. So if you're, in, as we've talked about in the last couple of weeks, I mean, if you are one who has faith, and we're going to talk about that this month, what that means. If you're one who believes in Jesus, then you are a child of God. And as we turn to chapter 4, the significance of it is Paul is uh, this master teacher writing this letter. In chapter 4, he's going to present to us exhibit A. He's going to present to the, the church in Rome. Here's, here's the proof. Here's the evidence Here's, the, here's the, the power of God's word, as you'll see it, that what we're saying is true. In verse 28 of chapter 3, it's interesting, he, he has a, like a, a summary. And he says, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. In a sentence, Romans 3, 28, Paul reemphasizes this whole thread of, of the letter to the Romans. That this is what he's saying. We maintain it. This is what we're holding to. Because not everybody in the first century, in the first century church, in the first century church in Rome, understood this or even believed this. But Paul is writing to say, this is the gospel. This is the power of God. We maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. He's re- reiterating what he said in uh, verse 22, 23. And so we see the power of the gospel. And this letter that Paul wrote to Romans, this this, uh, foundation that has been so thoroughly laid is going to be important for us as we go through the rest of the letter because in chapters 5, 6, 7, 8, all of these truths that are going to come and what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus in this world, it's all based on this premise that there is a righteousness that's been made known from God, and it's not according to your ability to follow the works of Old Testament law. It actually comes to you. It's given to you by faith in Jesus. You know, throughout church history, uh, it's been a little while since I've done this. Anyone else love church history? Because I I appreciate you. You study church history, and it is amazing the, the impact, the significance that this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Rome has had on the church. I mean, in your, um, in your New Testament, you have, as the flow of it, of course, we have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you have the book of Acts. The Gospels are the life and teaching of Jesus. The book of Acts is the historical record of the, the beginning of the church of Jesus. And then you have the beginning of the letters, and the first letter is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans is listed right after Acts. Why is that? It's not, as we'll see today, it's not because it was the first letter written. 
The New Testament is not arranged for us in a chronological way. It's the first letter written because it has the most, has had in church history, continues to have the most significance. This gospel, this powerful gospel that's presented changes people. And throughout church history, you see it. In fact, even in the first century, probably as soon as they got Paul's letter, people started copying it, you know? It's like, my turn, my turn. <laughs> and word for word, they're writing it down because it's, being, it's, it's starting to be spread throughout other, other churches. Other churches were receiving this letter. In fact, in 96, Clement of Rome actually quotes, we have a, a historical quote of him quoting from this letter to the Romans. And even before that, if you go to 2 Peter, uh, Peter actually w died around 68 or so. So Peter wrote before he died, obviously, he, he wrote before he died these words. He said, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Uh, some of you need to hear that today. That's a different sermon. But bear in mind that the Lord's patience with us means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. So the book of Romans, Paul wrote this letter in about 50, 56, 57 AD. Within 10 years, it's being quoted, and even Peter is saying, Paul has written these letters. But it wasn't the first letter written. It wasn't the first letter written, but it's like the most significant, and I think you'll see why. Uh, back to church history, other events, you know, Augustine is a, you know, one of these big monumental people in the, in the history of the church which really his, his influence, you know, uh, it's the Lord's influence, but what he wrote and said really helped create Western civilization as we know it. And when he, you know, was converted to Jesus in his own account, he's like, you know, hearing the encouragement to pick up and read. And so he picked up and read, and guess what he picked up and read? The letter of Paul to the Romans. In 1515, after the Dark Ages, uh, Martin Luther, a Catholic priest, was, began some lectures on the, on the letter of uh, Paul wrote to Rome. And 18 months of lectures out of this same letter, and the result was the Protestant Reformation, where he pounds those theses to the door, right, and says the church has to change. And the, the cry was the very words of Romans that said, you know, saved by grace through faith. And Romans, you know, after those lectures, it changed. And, and even in our own heritage, this letter has proven to be so powerful. And maybe even in your life. And if not in your life, I would say not yet in your life. Because if you pick up this letter and read it, it contains the power of this gospel. And it changes us from the inside out. God's good news, his thoughts, his love inserted into our minds as we read this letter. So who was this guy? The Apostle Paul. He was known first as uh, Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus meaning Tarsus is where he lived. Here, here on a map, you can see where in the world Tarsus was. Uh, that little red dot, can you see that? Up here, here's Jerusalem and Israel. A lot of things going on in the world right here, right? This is where Paul lived. This city, Tarsus was a hub in the Roman Empire. It was the place of great intellectual learning. It was also the capital of the, the region, that district, which included Syria. In fact, you see Syria. It was like a large thing. And this was the capital. This is where Paul was born and raised. Uh, he, so he would be very familiar with all the philosophies of the age. He would understand you know, how people thought about things. He would also understand Roman government and how things worked in the Roman Empire. This place is pretty strategically located because as far as being so close to the Mediterranean Sea, you know, commerce through the sea and also by land, it was one of those hubs. That's where Paul grew up. But more importantly about Saul, actually Saul, and even his name, 
right? He was named after that first king of Israel, Saul, right? He, more importantly, he was a Jew living in the Roman province, the Roman city of Tarsus. He was a Jew. And when he writes the letter, he begins to write the letter to Rome. Now, if we back out a little bit, you can see that's where Paul lived. Here's the boot of Rome. And even in the letter, he talks about how he wants to come and visit them so that they can help him get on to Spain. So if we look even larger, you know, here's Spain. That's where Paul lived. He's writing to Rome. That's, he's hoping to go to Spain. Why? For the gospel. For the gospel. This message of the kingdom of heaven come to earth. This message of a righteousness that's from God given to all who believe. So Paul was a church planter. But this is, this is who he was. He was a Jew. So we read in Philipp, uh, Philippians chapter 3, for instance, when Paul starts talking about himself, he says, you know, if someone thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Some people wonder, did Paul struggle with a little arrogance maybe? A little, probably. Don't we all? Half of us. Let's say half of us do. The rest of us need more confidence. The rest of us struggle with pride. He says, I have more. And he goes on to tell about himself. He says, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. Faultless. He was a Jew, and he was a Jew of Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a faultless Pharisee who taught. And so when, you, when we're introduced to this man, Saul of Tarsus, in the book of Acts, if you want to turn there with me, we're going to read a little bit. In Acts chapter 8, we see Saul. And actually, if we go a couple verses into chapter 7, chapter 7 is when Stephen is... This deacon, Stephen, is proclaiming the truth about Jesus. And, he, of course, people, they end up stoning him because of this. And it says, so this, uh, while they were stoning him, verse 59, S Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees, cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep, he died. And Saul approved of their killing him. This is the same Saul, same Saul, later known as the Apostle Paul. He approved of them killing Stephen. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. He was so zealous for God and so faultless in keeping the law that any untruth, any wrongdoing was going to be done right by him and to the extent of persecuting the church, which if you turn the page to the next chapter, uh, chapter 9, we see Saul says he was still breathing out murderous threats. Are you getting a picture of who this guy was? He was breathing out murderous threats. How does somebody like this end up writing arguably the most significant letter in the New Testament? He was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So he was in Jerusalem. He's going to travel a day or two north to Damascus because he heard that there were these Christ followers up there. Give me letters because we're going to make it. We're going to make this wrong right. We're going to snuff out this untruth. And so he got those letters. Uh, he wanted them so if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. 
The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see anything. He could, not, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. I always think that's kind of funny, you know. The Lord is saying to Ananias, in a vision, he's seeing a man named Ananias. If, my name's Ananias. <laughs> yeah, he, right? That's right. And uh, he, Ananias is going to come and place his hands on him to receive his sight. Uh, Lord, even with that, notice what Ananias says. Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. What are we learning from this? The Lord knew Saul. The Lord chose Saul. He will be my chosen instrument to proclaim to the Gentiles the name of Jesus. And he will suffer. And if you've ever read through Acts, you see that both of these things are true. We see the suffering of, of Saul of Tarsus. We also see his um, proclaiming the name of Jesus throughout the known world. So Ananias goes. Ananias, verse 17, went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is God's chosen people. The Lord chose Saul of Tarsus to be his chosen instrument. And part of what he was doing was choosing him to write what ends up being like half of the New Testament. Paul writes these letters to these churches among the Gentiles that he helps plant. And then he writes, some of them he hadn't been a part of, but he'd, like Rome, he hadn't been there yet, but he'd heard of their faith. And he writes them this letter to encourage them and to present to them the true gospel of Jesus in all of its strength and all of its power. Jesus chose Saul for this. Some say, you know, if you, as you read through the book of Acts, you see, of course, Judas, uh, you know, killed himself. He betrayed Jesus. And can, can imagine the remorse. And the disciples, while they were waiting, said, what should we do? Well, we can't have 11 disciples. Let's pick somebody. They cast lots as humans do, right? We, we find creative ways to do things, so they threw some dice and they say, hey, all right, Matthias, you're the guy, you're the 12th apostle. All the while, it's thought Jesus had already selected his 12th apostle. He was going to appear to him, which is one of the definitions of an apostle. We, you know, it's like we need somebody who has actually seen and heard the Lord, Jesus. <laughs> the road to Damascus is that. Paul encountered the living Christ and he became this chosen instrument to do what he did. And interestingly, through church, the book of Acts and church history, we never hear anything about, him, about Matthias, if what he did or didn't do. But boy, do we hear about Saul of Tarsus. And he's the one, this one who previously was breathing murderous threats against the Lord's people. He's the one who's going to write this letter to the Romans. But not right away. He didn't write this letter right away. Um, in fact, he, he wrote Galatians before he wrote Romans. You know, we call Galatians mini-Romans because it's shorter, and it, but it has some of the same themes. But it was probably s 
six, seven, eight years before he wrote Romans that he wrote Galatians. And while there are the same themes in Romans, it's an entirely different tone. Paul is writing to people that want, you know, we call it, you know, there's these Judaizers, is one title we have for them, who really what they were wanting to do, some stronger than others, was, yeah, we want the Gentiles to come to faith in Jesus, but they must become Jews first in order to receive Jesus. And, and the mark of a Jew, of course, covenantal mark of a Jew was circumcision. So as you can imagine, there were a bunch of Jew, Gentiles saying, uh, no, thank you. You know, I mean, I'm not interested in that. But no, you have to have this sign of righteousness and become a Jew because Jews are God's chosen people in order to receive Jesus, the Messiah, who himself was a Jew. And Paul is saying in Galatians, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. It's almost as if Galatians, Paul hears about what's going on. He was known to blow gaskets from time to time. And so he's writing Galatians. I mean, you read it, and that's a little bit how it sounds. But then seven years later, right, he writes Romans. The issue was still an issue in the church, but Romans is his treatise. Romans is his thoughtful, measured uh, how can I best present this? Because I think that's what happened. You know, we learn in, in Galatians. We learn in Galatians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. All right, there it is. Notice what we learn about Paul in Galatians. Verse, verse 13. He talks about his previous life. For you've heard about my previous way of life in Judaism how I intensely persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the tradition of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God and that what I'm writing to you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. So we get a picture of, of Saul, now known as Paul, right, his life, and when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he actually spent three years. I mean, he went out into the desert. Not that he stayed in the desert for three years, but he was out there. What was he doing for all those three years? And then coming back in Damascus, and then 14 years later, I mean, he's coming up to Jerusalem to talk to the apostles and the leaders. He, he is a Hebrew of Hebrews, and in all of that time out in the desert, he, I believe he is processing what this means for him as a Jew. He writes Galatians, you know, in that, in that time. But then, uh, what does it mean for me as a Jew? How can I best present this? And the letter to the Roman church is what we have. He's putting it all together, saying, here it is. What about the Roman church? Just a, a word about them. You know, this is the group of people that received this letter. And it's interesting because we have all kinds of historical information about Rome in the first century. It was a part of the Roman Empire. In fact, the whole empire was called Roman Empire because that was the capital. It was the most important city in the world. There was two million people living there. And 
there was a church. Paul had never been there. There's no, we don't know how the church started except to say that on the day of Pentecost, when the church began, right? It says in Acts 2, verse 10 and 11, it says, uh, give that to me. There were, visiting from, there were visitors from Rome, is what it says. Do I have that verse? I didn't put it up there? All right. It says there were visitors from Rome, Jews and converts to Judaism, Acts 2, 10 and 11. When the, when the church was born on the day of Pentecost, there were visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Jews were not opposed at all to converting and allowing non-Jewish people to become a part of the Jewish faith. Not at all. But if they were going to become a part of the Jewish faith, like those in Rome did, they'd have to become Jews in order to be in the covenantal relationship with God. And there were, on the day of Pentecost, visitors from Rome. And so, you know, it's easy to think. Eventually, you have to go back home And when these visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, went back home to Rome, hey, that rhymes, they they took the gospel of Jesus with them. And when Paul writes them here, the letter to the Romans, it had already been a church thriving, growing for 15, 20 years. How do we know this? In Acts chapter 18, interesting note, Uh, Acts 18, verses 1 and 2, Paul leaves Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius, emperor of Rome, Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome, Paul went to see them. Claudius kicked out all the Jews out of Rome. Get these people out of here. And then... History, you can find this, look up some Roman history books. Then, when Claudius dies in 49, all the Jews are invited, welcome to come back to Rome. But he kicked them out. Why? Because the church of Jesus in the 40s had so much influence, so much, it was uh, growing. The message of Jesus was spreading. That, like it did in every other place, it seems, it caused conflict with the Jews who said, no, 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 that's not how you relate to God. And for the Romans and for Emperor Claudius, the way of Jesus and the people that follow Jesus, they were just Jews. They were, it was like a Jewish sect. There's something going on in that Jewish religion, and now all of a sudden there's a ruckus and there's a riot and there's problems. Just kick them all out. And, they, and he booted all the Jews The church of Jesus in Rome for a decade, 15 years maybe, was so effective that it caused problems for non-Jesus following Jews to the point where they all got kicked out. When Paul writes the letter in 57, now remember, 49, the Jews are welcome back. 56, 57, Paul writes the letter. At the end of the letter, Romans 16, 3 and 4, Paul, when he's writing, he says, hey, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the faith. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful for them. He's writing a letter to Rome. Greet Aquila and Priscilla. Why? Because they were back in Rome. They were back in Rome. So the church that he's writing to is doing the kingdom work. But, but the issue of the first century, the, the letter to the Romans addresses, is this very strong perspective from from Jewish people that you must, to in order to relate to holy God, you must become one of the chosen people of God, meaning Jew, Jews. You must become a Jew. There was a way for Gentiles to do that. And then once a Jew, you could, then you could accept Jesus. That was the way. And Paul writes this letter to say, like we said, verse uh, Romans 3, 28, we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This is is the thread. This is the letter. And in this uh, teaching, throughout this letter, Paul teaches, it's so powerful for us. You may have never been, some of us have. You know, we we are familiar with Jews. Maybe we're Jewish and we understand the Jewish holidays. We understand, many of you understand simply because you read the Old Testament. 
Uh, Old Testament, another way to think of that is it's the Old Covenant. And even in that phraseology, it's, an old, it's the Old Covenant. It was the covenant with, of God with people, this agreement with God. This is how you can relate to God. The New Covenant is found in Jesus, and it's different. We learn so much from the Old Covenant about God and the need for a Savior, and the New Covenant teaches us good news, that there is a righteousness offered to us apart from the works of the Old Testament law. Uh, one of the things that people get stumble on is, um, you know, we've talked about not needing performance, but even the letter that James wrote, uh, there's been people throughout history who's like, man, we love Paul, this grace by faith in Jesus, but James starts talking about, I mean, it's, there, there needs to be some works evidence, and so is it, is it James, is it Paul? And if you, if you can understand that they're talking about different things here, Paul is talking about accomplishing the works of the Old Testament law. James is saying, if you have faith that saves, you're, you're naturally going to have, you're naturally going to have uh, fruit of God's spirit in your life that's going to result in good works. It's just the fruit of walking with Jesus. And they're talking about two different things. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that get thrown under. Well, I'm not saved by works. That's true. You're saved by Jesus. But there are to be evidence of his saving work in your life, right? And that's what James is writing about. So why is this important? Well, Paul is addressing this important issue of does a person need to become a Jew in order to become a Christ follower? And he maintains that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the Old Testament law. And exhibit A, we turn the page into Romans chapter four. And this is what we're gonna be looking at the next couple weeks. Exhibit A stands for Abraham. A stands for Abraham. And you look at what he says, and now, why did we go a deep dive into who Paul was and what he was doing and where he lived? And why did we talk about the Roman church and the Jews and those converted to Judaism? Because Paul, in his precise and brilliant teaching is going to use the person found in the Old Testament that's going to resonate potentially the strongest with the Jews and those who've been converted to Judaism. Abraham actually is known as the father of faith, and not just Jewish faith, Christian faith. Muslims even claim this person named Abraham, right? He is this picture. You can read about him starting in Genesis chapter 12, and then Genesis 25 records the death of Abraham. And in that, you you see this person who's known as the father of faith. Paul, the brilliant master teacher who has spent all these years processing through what the gospel of Jesus means for his Judaism and for the Gentile world, he takes Abraham and he says, here's exhibit A. So in verse one, he writes, what shall we say that? What shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? Abraham's exhibit A. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And in that phrase, Paul is quoting Genesis 15, 6. Genesis 12 is where God calls Abraham. Abraham, come, I'm gonna take you to a land you've never been to. I'm gonna make you into a great nation. I will bless the world through you. It's this call of Abraham. It wasn't until chapter, many, many years later, Genesis 15, where, where Abraham is saying, Lord, you told me, I mean, look at the sky and the stars, and this is how many descendants I'm gonna have. And my wife and I said, we have no children. We're both over 100 years old. I mean, he was approaching 100. She was approaching 90. And and God reiterates the promise of what he is going to do. And Abraham, against all hope, I mean, there is nothing, humanly speaking, that would make you say, oh, that makes sense, God. But Abraham believed God, and 
Genesis 15, 6 says, and that faith, right? God credited that faith to him as righteousness. And Paul brings this as exhibit A because it wasn't until Genesis 17, two chapters later, again, much time transpired, where the whole covenant of circumcision was established. Where this is gonna be the outward mark of that you're my covenantal people. And so Paul is saying, God, God credited this to him before he did this work of the law, this work of righteousness. And he explains it, verse four. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts in God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Paul's saying, just like Abraham believed and, it was, and righteousness was credited to their account, whoever believes God in this, whoever has faith in Jesus, God is crediting this righteousness to their account. It's not earned. You know, if it was something deserved, if it was like wages, it's not a gift if it's wages. If you work and expect what you, you, it's rightful that you get wages for your work. This is not that. This is a gift. And Abraham believed God. That belief, that faith before God had done it was credited to him as righteousness. And the same is true for us. We're going to understand in the next couple of weeks what this kind of faith means, what, what it means, what it looks like to have faith that is credited to, as righteousness. I love verse 4 and 5 uh, because faith is going to, as we'll see, is going to be connected to trusting God and trusting in this one, as the scripture says, who justifies the ungodly. I hope you hear this today. Our God is a God who justifies the ungodly. I like the translation wicked. It hits me better. Our God, the one we worship, justifies the wicked people. Before they do anything to deserve anything, by faith, he credits righteousness to wicked people. They are forgiven. They are raised up. They are established as children of God. This is the grace of God on display. This is what and who we have. So imagine we have a God who justifies wicked people. And if you're an ungodly, wicked person, welcome to the family. Because it's not according to what we say or according to what we do. It's not according to what you do. It's according to what you believe. Do you believe that the promise of God is true? That Christ, what he accomplished on the cross is sufficient to pay the penalty for your sins. If you believe in Jesus today, that faith is credited to your account as righteousness. Think about it this way. To what does it require to enter this covenant of grace? Well, to enter the covenant of grace where you can actually be in relationship with God. I mean, what, don't, don't you want to know this? Like, how can I, an un an unholy person, I know the depths of my sin. How can I be in relationship with all the Almighty, a holy God? He's made the way for this to happen. You can be in a relationship with God today. What you need to be in this covenant of grace. Now, the Jews said, well, what you need is evidence of righteousness. You need circumcision. You need some works. You need to keep all the Old Testament law. You need evidence. And Paul's writing to say, nope. It's not evidence of righteousness that you need. The Old Testament law, the Old Testament story panned out that it, it didn't work. It just pointed out that we are truly wicked people and we need a savior. So God prov provides a savior to be an expression of his grace. And so what we need to enter into this relationship, this covenant relationship with God, what we need is faith to believe that Jesus is who he said he is, to believe that what he did for us on the cross covers our sins, 
to believe that we've been adopted into God's family. We are, you are a son or a daughter of the most high God. Yeah, but I, I still struggle with temptation and sin. Yes, you do. But faith says you've been credited this righteousness. You are part of God's family. I don't understand how things are going. What, right, but you have faith in the one who does understand the beginning, the end, and the middle, right? Your faith is what is credited to you as righteous, and it's the pathway God has provided for you to be in this relationship with him by his grace. So we're celebrating that. I hope you have your communion, because we're going to sing a couple songs, and then we're going to eat the bread, which represents the body of Christ. We're going to drink the cup this morning, which represents the blood that he shed. We're going to eat and drink and remember that Christ death for us has the great meaning. And we believe that he is the savior of the world. And we believe that he is the savior of us. And we believe that we are part of his family. Does your heart say amen today?